around uh, campus in, in the room today who, who oversee the three other Fulbright programs as well. Um, I do wanna take the time to especially thank uh, Mabel and Claire, who I know are in the actual luncheon room over in the Wright Union, um, if they could both wave briefly right now and everyone acknowledge them a little bit. Um, they are the absolute backbone of our committee. Like I said, for me, it's a it's a very honorific role. I get the wonderful privilege of interviewing um, our esteemed guests, but Mabel and Claire really do all of the work. They put together, you know, the catering that you're all enjoying, uh, reserving rooms, doing doing all of the behind the scenes um, things. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Matt Miturko, who's in the graduate school. He also does a lot of our committee's behind the scenes technical work, and we really, really appreciate him as well. Um, I also know that in the luncheon room in the Wright Union, there are a number of folks who are on our campus Fulbright Lecture Committee, and I would like those folks to maybe now give a wave as well in recognition for um, the hard work with steering and direction um, of things that we do. I'd particularly like to highlight Karen Reed, who I know is there. Um, Karen was the one who said in an email, when our committee was really trying to decide who, who should we you know, invite and, and try to, to book to be our speaker for um, our annual Fulbright lunch. And she's the one who emailed and said, okay, this is a total pipe dream, but somebody that I know that's a Fulbrighter that I would love to see would be Rebecca Camisa. Um, and lo and behold, she said yes, which is where we are now. Um, so I'm going to thank her and introduce her by way of her biography here, and we'll get started with the discussion. So Rebecca Camisa is a two-time Oscar-nominated and Emmy Award-winning filmmaker. Her first feature documentary film, Sister Helen, aired on HBO and won the 2002 Sundance Film Festival's Documentary Directing Award. Rebecca founded Documentarist Films, teamed up with Mr. Mud Productions, and directed and produced the 2010 Oscar-nominated documentary, Which Way Home, for which she also received a Fulbright Fellowship for filmmaking. Which Way Home is a documentary that follows several children who are attempting to get from Mexico and Central America to the United States on top of a freight train that crosses Mexico known as La Bestia or The Beast. Camisa received a Fulbright Scholar Grant to make the documentary in 2006, and the film premiered on HBO on August 24, 2009. I know many of you in the Right Union right now were able to join us for the documentary screening yesterday that we also held as the first half of this event. Which Way Home was nominated for a 2010 Independent Spirit Award for Best Documentary and received four Emmy nominations. Which Way Home went on to win a News and Documentary Emmy Award for Outstanding International Programming, and the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Awards Grand Prize. Rebecca's next films, God is the Bigger Elvis in 2012, received an Oscar nomination, and Atomic Homefront from 2018 received a 2019 Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award. So with that, um, she can't hear you all, but please join me in giving Rebecca a round of applause of gratitude um, for joining us today. So thank you, Rebecca, for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're absolutely delighted. Like I said, we're, we're really, really over the moon that you could be here with us. Um, so for those of you who may not know, Rebecca and I are actually going to really kind of engage in just a discussion about the film. Um, and we do invite Q&A uh, from the audience as well. You'll notice at the tables that you're at, there's some writing utensils with some note cards. Um, at the front of the room is Amila T. Amila, give a wave yourself, perhaps. Um, if you have a question about the documentary or a question for um, Rebecca, please do, by all means, write it down and Amila will send it my way and we can um, get going with the, the Q&A from the audience as well. So we really do want you to engage. But um, Rebecca, as, as you know, I have some questions um, for you as well after I watched the documentary recently. Um, and I... I kind of really want to jump into the one that um, maybe isn't, you know, the easiest question, but um, one of the ones that I certainly had, why title the documentary, Which Way Home? Why, um, why was that the, the choice that, that um, resulted in, in its title? 
Well, because, you know, a lot of children, not all of the children we followed, but for example, Olga and Freddie are a good example of it. They have their home country, but their family is in another country. So they so much want to get to that country. So which to hopefully be with their loved ones, but which place is really home? And wherever one goes, does that make one happy? Can adjust once they have gone to a different land to live in, but yet the home they were raised in is elsewhere? So while that's a very long title in itself, what I've just explained, the only way we could sort of whittle it down to make it quick and memorable was which way home. So that was sort of the thinking behind it. Awesome. And so why did you choose to tell the story um, of which way home? I know really, you know, all of the children um, that were filmed had different stories, but obviously many of them had stories that were, that were the same as well. So why, why this story? What, what first um, kind of attracted you to La Bestia and the, the children, you know, that ride it? Well, actually the film that I was interested in making was not this one. It was actually much darker and it was worse of a story. And I don't think at the time I was prepared to be able to tell it. It was actually how children are harvested for their organs mm -hmm. and how one of the biggest buyers is, or rather the United States is certainly part of that grisly trade. Um, not to say it officially is, but, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, at the time, I didn't think I could do a proper investigation about it and how to tell it and how to really get into that world. And strangely enough, a friend of mine had called me and he told me about a story that he read um, in the Los Angeles Times. And he sent it to me. He said, you really should do this film. And when I read it, it wasn't the same story that I was thinking about, but yet it shocked me because I wasn't really aware of this one either. But I thought to myself, you know what? This is very visual. This is a story I think I could tell and work to make happen. So I left behind the organ trafficking idea mm -hmm. and moved on to child migrants trying to find their families. You know, and that coincided back in, what was this, 2002, 2003, what coincided was this, I think, derelict behavior on the part of news organizations, broadcast news organizations, that would have these pundits on, that would really slam migrants and, you know, whittle them into the numbers and, and dehumanize them. And this was on television all the time. Um, mm -hmm. You weren't literally hearing journalists who went anywhere and really looked into the story. They were just spouting, you know, vitriol. And this was sort of, I don't know if students would remember this. This was back in 2002, 2003, and maybe they were too young for it. But at the time, I just thought this was outrageous that broadcast news would rely on these people to be anchors of television programs and to, and to be so non-journalistic in their behavior. And then you, you have the airwaves and the TV waves and you can broadcast into every home and then manipulate the public into believing this sort of stuff. So I was very angry for a very long time. I'd scream and yell expletives at the TV. I'd throw things at it, you know. And then I thought, you're a filmmaker. Stop complaining about them and what they do. Get out there and put something on television or a broadcast that people can see the other side of it. To remind people that the United States has a very dark past and it's the country of immigrants, right? Um, so people forget who they are, where they come from. And I just wanted to inject that discussion back into the American broadcast kind of realm. Um, so sorry to make it such a long, <laughs> winded answer but that's that was the process yeah. that's it yeah yeah well so i i know i mentioned to you when we chatted um before that i was gonna you know also inject this is our fulbright luncheon so i wanted to inject some you know I, concepts to do with fulbright and the process you know of applying and then actually doing it and everything as well 
And um, I'm really curious, did you, um, when you were initially applying for Fulbright, did you propose that, that first idea that you had about the organ harvesting or were you were proposing um, which way home then? And, 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 you know, if you're gonna propose something, you better yeah. make sure you can tell the story or you have the <laughs> mechanism and the backing to be able to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And the more, you know, I looked at other organ harvesting films or I looked into the story, this one French journalist actually focused on Central America and Mexico and was really the person who really was the first to try and document this because France was also a big buyer of retinas. So, hmm. but she was a seasoned journalist who had resources. And the more I looked into it, I thought, gee, could I go into cover in some hospital on the border where they sneak organs, like do the midnight shift and try and just see what's good. And I thought there's, there's just no way I'm gonna be able to do this on my own. Right. So I thought, if I'm going to propose an idea, I better be able to execute it and do it properly um, and do it safely. So I, I, I don't really propose ideas until I really think about it and think about how I can do it and really make it happen. That's when I start proposing. So I started, I, I use the traditional funding. I mean, this is the irony, right? So I tried the traditional funding routes for documentary film. We had won a directing award at Sundance. So I went to the Sundance Documentary Fund for development, you know, development money. And I went to other. And in filmmaking, you're always told, well, bring us back footage, let us see the story, and then we'll make a decision. So when you're dealing with broadcasters like Netflix or HBO or whatever, they really want to see something before they're going to then give you more money. So I really had to start off with figuring out how can I get some development money to at least go. But the interesting thing was, so I received development money from Sundance, which was lovely. And then to be able to come from another country to go into another country to do the issue of migration, you know, you have to get permissions or you have to at least, if you're gonna go into these worlds, you have to figure out how you can make that happen. So what of course I needed to do, I needed to get a visa to go, right? To spend an extended period of time. You know, I'm not on vacation, I'm there to work. So you need a visa. Well. I tried to get a visa, not happening. Like just, I tried and tried and tried, it wasn't happening. Okay. So then I thought, you know, where else can I go for money? And I thought, well, let me, I think it was a Guggenheim. I think I tried to apply for a Guggenheim. And then I thought, well, this is abroad. Let me try a Fulbright. Because I tried getting a Fulbright in college and got rejected. But then again, I wanted to go to a war zone. So perhaps Fulbright thought, no, we're not sending a junior or senior in college to a war zone. You know, so they were probably smart in rejecting me. So I figured, well, I won't, I won't do Fulbright ever again. <laughs> and, then, and then I thought, so this is how many years later, I mean, right? Well, over a decade later or more. And I thought, well, let me just try. I said, perhaps Guggenheim will do it, but Fulbright will never support this project because it's too sensitive. Mm -hmm. But I'll apply anyway, what the hell? Because really in trying to gain, get money. And so the irony was I get the rejection from, I think it was Guggenheim, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to misstate it, but there was another big, huge grant that I just knew I was going to get, which I didn't. And boom, what came through? Fulbright. And I was really shocked. And what was even better is you get a visa mm -hmm. to go. And which was like, like, bingo, <laughs> problem solved. And also when you are working, you know, it is a responsibility when you go to another country, you're representing the nation you're coming from. But it also that Fulbright, not only getting a visa to work, but it also, that is Fulbright. That's the US government supporting your project. So if you go to mm -hmm. other government entities to get their permission, so they understand what you're doing, that helps create you know, a support system of letters and a paper trail that you know, 
helps your project. And if you are going into sensitive areas, having the paperwork <laughs> and giving it to the cops that stop you for no reason, and then they see it's official, they let you go. So it was very helpful in that way too. You know, you can sort of navigate the problems that could arise by you drawing attention to what you're doing. So the Fulbright, in, in, in retrospect, I'm so glad necessarily that if I had to get one grant that the other didn't give it to me because Fulbright was actually the perfect and most appropriate grant to make this film with and on. Um, because in the end, I ended up living, you know, because this film was so hard to fund, it was a nightmare. I my stipend was, you know, used to make the film. I mean, I paid my expenses and stuff, but then it's not like I got my entire stipend because I was spending money on getting the film made. Um, so the Fulbright was just transformational. And I, in retrospect, looking back at the film, would I have been as successful in certain ways getting it made if I hadn't had the Fulbright? Probably not. That's amazing. That's really interesting because I, I have questions about like how did the US government say yes and then the Mexican government was cooperative as well as you know maybe the the film yeah. that you did in um the other countries kind of later on that's really that is incredible I really was curious about how everyone came together to to approve those things um so did you work with a, a crew then that was already in Mexico because if I remember from probably something I just inferred in watching it I don't believe it was you on top of the train um, doing, but correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah. So let me, yeah, I'll tell you how we worked. So, and this was before Fulbright, um, because I started filming in 2004, 2000, hold on, 2004, 2005, I'm forgetting, it was quite a while ago, but around that time. So I received Sundance money initially, this was well before Fulbright, but what I was able to do was buy some equipment, with half the money. And then the other half, I made a plan to go to Mexico. But what I did was I reached out. I reached out to see what Mexican cinematographers there were, production coordinators, producers. Like, you know, I don't bring crew from the States to go in to other countries. That doesn't make sense. You wanna hire people that are there, right? You mm -hmm. wanna give money, put money into the economy, give people jobs, right? So I prefer working with people from, you know, instead of, bringing people in that doesn't, you know, make sense to me, especially I'm not Mexican. I'm not Central American. These are cultures that are foreign to me. Um, I'm not the greatest Spanish speaker. You know, I didn't spend 10 years studying the language and then, to, you know, going. So to me, I used the money to go down, meet people, in the Mexican film industry that did documentaries and then met with one person in particular named Alejandra Lisiaga, who she was very instrumental in dealing with all of the things that were necessary as a producer and a coordinating producer. She introduced me to people to meet who could be potential sound people, cinematographers. And because this was a story where you're going into dangerous situations, right? I had to meet with people who were up for that or, or had already been around long enough or understood the world in order to go through it because completely foreign to me. So the, so we went, so I went down for that first, I bought equipment, took it with me, went down and we were able to get permission to do a couple of things, but I was only there for like three weeks tops. So I did come back with footage, mm -hmm. but not, clearly enough for an entire film. Um, but I'm losing my train of thought. I just wanted to get back to one thing in particular. No, because I'm now I'm thinking about all these things we did. So if you're but, doing perfect. You're actually answering a lot of the questions. Okay. Already and now me. my mind is remembering all it. So it's throwing me off the track. But, but to get back to your question about access or, but this is what we did. I'm a, I'm a shooter as well as a director, producer, I also film. Granted, mm -hmm. I'm not the greatest cinematographer in the world, but I'm a shooter and all on all my other films, I, I'm a, I'm, I shoot as well. So um, the idea, because we had so little money, I mean, this isn't like I came with hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a film, <laughs> no. 
not at all. We were inching along. So I had cinematographer, then I was second camera, and we had a sound man, and then we had a driver who would track us. Now, so when we did go off and film, we were on top of the train. That wasn't our goal. My goal isn't to get on tops of trains, believe me, not at all. That's what the subjects did. And we followed them. Um, so I was, you know, as director, also when someone's doing the interview, for example, when you see Kevin on top of the train talking about what he wants to do and what's, I'm filming because the interviewer who is the cinematographer is now taking over to do the interview. So I'm shooting. So we worked that way. For example, Olga and Freddie, I shot that because the cinematographer was acting as interviewer. Because my lang not only were my language skills not totally up to, you know, that um, amount of fluency, but more importantly, um, there are certain changes in language, certain things that you know people in Honduras have a different way of speaking, it's, and what am I, but yet the native speakers were better at catching that and understanding those changes than I would have ever been. Also, to be honest, I'm a female. And I'm in countries where women aren't necessarily controlling things. And I think it was more comfortable for these young boys to talk to a guy. I thought about that as well. When I I'm also from the United States. Yeah. I'm from a place they want to go to. Mm -hmm. I'm from New York. So I represent this whole thing. And the way they would have I guess communicated with me would have been a bit different, but because they're talking to the cinematographer who knows and they feel more comfortable or they feel more relaxed. So I wanted that too. I didn't want this kind of wall or this concern that they may have had. So that's how we worked. We had a very fluid way of working. That's great. And I mean, that's such a, a small crew doing so many different things at once everybody was really playing a lot of roles. That's, that's really amazing. Um, so we're actually going to turn the video back on for the room so you can see all of the attendees now. I think things sure. are quiet down there a little bit. Um, but uh, we're going to keep going, obviously, with our questions as well. And yes, there's everyone. Hello, everybody. Um, and um, just and actually, there have been a lot of audience submission questions. So this is really exciting. Um, the movie was filmed about 15 years ago now, if my math is, is correct. Oh, um, say, oh you're aging. Me by the <laughs> oh my God. Um, do you probably do you <laughs> think this situation, um, it, you know, the, the subjects generally that you were filming, do you think the situations are any better, any worse about the same? Do, do you have any sort of speculation about that? I'm going to throw it back with a question to you and the audience. This situation can be solved by Congress. I want someone to tell me what has Congress done in the last, I'll be nice, 20 years to make the situation better. Anybody have a response to that? point entirely. I can hear a pin drop. <laughs> so I made the film in hopes that, the, you know, and I know, listen, the film has been used in outreach by governments in Central America and Mexico and also the US government. It's been used for sensitivity training. I mean, I hate to say this, people will laugh, but ICE has used it, FEMA has used it, Border Patrol has used it, immigration, the immigration judges have used, I mean, the film has been you, you know, for outreach, which is what it was right. meant to be. But, you know, most importantly, make laws, pass reform that doesn't have to lead to people making these horrible decisions. But guess what? What was it a month ago people were under a Texas bridge? I'm not even bringing up the family separation issue. So, um, hmm, what do you, you know, that's my answer. 
I, I, yeah, and it, it, it does, am I answering your question? I mean, I don't want to. You are. I think the, I think it's you know interesting because if I, someone who does not study this, um, and did recently live for ten years in Arizona, um, in near the Sonoran Desert, um, and, and close enough to certainly borders, I I would say that the situation has gotten gravely worse. And maybe if it hasn't gotten worse we've just at least been made more aware of it um, and aware of the lack of anything, yeah, certainly happening. Um, so I have a number of people who are asking a very similar question um, and I'm, I am actually afraid of the answer, though I feel like it's a <laughs> felt question. Um, do you- What I'm gonna do just to be on the same side, I just noticed are that you my battery, my batteries, oh, no. I'm just putting, I'm plugging, no, 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 we can talk, keep no going, yeah. I'm just going to make sure this thing gets in here, that's all. Yeah, absolutely. So keep um, do you still, again, given that this was, you know, 15 years ago, and I know at the end of the film, you did give some updates, are there, um, do you have contact at all with any of the children, or does any of the crew that you have, um, that who are, you know, if, if now living are all likely young adults? Yeah, I mean, I everyone it's I have the same phone number I did when I made this film. So everyone mm -hmm. has my phone number. Um, and people contact me from time to time. I mean, certainly because I, and I don't even I I don't <laughs> things were horrifying fine under the last administration, right? We won't talk mm -hmm. about which one that was, the one that will remain nameless. But um this administration isn't really you know, floating my boat either. So I, if I do hear from people from time to time, I never let the public know that because I don't want, oh yeah, oh, they showed up and they're in Florida. Oh, they're in Ocala or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't want people being all of a sudden search, you know, it's a very weird time. Hopefully we're climbing out of it. But um, I do hear from people from time to time. I just don't put that, that, um, that um, information out. That seems important, I mean, to continue having the impact that it does, right? I mean, that's a really good evidence of why many of us are wondering like, oh, what happened, what happened? Um, so that, that makes a lot of sense. It's also, I have to be careful, for example, someone recently in the last couple of months said, oh, I'm this person from your film. And what I try and do is before I even respond, because who knows who that is? Like, this is the thing about the mm -hmm. internet. Anyone can say there's somebody to try and get information. Right. So I try and figure out, I try and then reach back to other contexts. Is this person really here? Like, where is this? I try and find out, is this the person they're really saying they are? Right. It's just a, it's, it's odd. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's completely fair. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, but I have heard yeah. from people and they have my number. Okay, now I'm gonna plug this yeah. in, keep talking. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so a question that I had and something that struck me um, as I was watching the film and frankly, maybe this is actually just a statement of the very most obvious, but something that I, you know, was really, really struck by was that the children constantly, no matter, the the you know issue they maybe were were facing as it was being portrayed in the film um that day or that moment they they always seemed so hopeful and that you know reaching the us that that that, that it, everything was just gonna be great when they got to where they were going and on the other hand all of the adults that you interviewed either in the us or back in their home countries all seemed extremely regretful, um, in, in despair. I guess I'm wondering, would regretful be a word that you would say um, or confirm that, that you encountered with the adults? Because um, I did find it just their, their demeanor so different from the children. Um, well, but subject. children children are magical thinkers and they, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they're not burdened by the same mindset we adults are, right? We view things very differently. And so for children, yes, there's always hope. Yes, there's so much they haven't experienced that they're gonna hope it's better. But the adults have the, you know, they have, they understand retrospect. Right. When they first come and then years go by and then they realize I, you know, it's more about the realization of what was lost. 
And that only gets gained by living through it to the point where you're gonna lose. Mm -hmm. So of course, children are forward thinking, but especially the grandmother, if you're speaking, you know, yeah. she's had all these years of toiling in the United States, hoping that, th that dreams would occur. And then when they don't come true, she realizes, I don't think it was really worth it after all. But what's interesting is after that, she still paid to bring a child, another child. I mean, they don't stop, right. the behavior doesn't stop because now you've already put in this much. You're gonna go the whole route to try and reunify. Mm -hmm. um, but that's right. I mean, observe a child and then observe us, we adults, we're all oppressed, we're all in our heads, right? But what's not happening? <laughs> well, and like I said, having lived in Arizona fairly recently, the, um, you know, demeanor of the U.S. Border Patrol agent that you um, portrayed and his opinion on, you know, what the adults should be feeling or be like was, was not terribly surprising to me, to be terribly honest. Yeah, he's right, you know, but he's right in a very logic, I mean, following his logic, he's absolutely right. right. You don't want your child to be harmed, don't stick them in the middle of a criminal network and expect not something bad to happen. That being mm -hmm. said, I think the issue is what is happening in people's lives in the nations they're living in that is making changes so that they don't feel desperate enough to do it. Right. So you've got his viewpoint, which I totally agree with, but the other side of it is you know, and let's get back to like the perception of, let's think about a perception of a US audience. We're all spoiled, right? We're all entitled. Even if we're not rich, we are okay. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to go, yeah. Are you crazy to put your child in that? I would never do that to my child, right? Right, because we are not forced to live with the non-choices other people do. So the point of making the film was yes, presenting the logic of it, that it's dangerous, please don't sell, send children, which was also part of the outreach for the film. So that people in rural communities understand it isn't easy, which they already Interesting. know. But yeah. um, on the other side, what's been done lately for people to make a different decision? And putting aside the US-Mexico thing, what about the Darien Gap? You know, there's been a lot more journalism about the Darien Gap, which is just insane. Well, mm. I mean. Actually, I have a student who applied for Fulbright last year to go do interviews in the Darien Gap. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Did she uh, get it? <laughs> Did they get it? The Fulbright? Um, <laughs> it's a toughie. I'm trying, now I'm trying to remember if that was this year and so we're still waiting for oh. if it. We're still waiting on that one. <laughs> if right. memory serves me, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a question, um, it, many of us um, in the room, because I was just over in the room, we're talking about Olga, the young girl um, that, that uh, you filmed. Were there many young girls? Um, I, it, you know, I know at the beginning it said only about 5% of those traveling on the beast were, were children, um, but were, I, my guess is that it was overwhelmingly male represented. Yeah, but there were, I mean, there's everybody. Yeah. And there's one right. scene we don't have. There was also like an eight month old, eight month old, excuse me, an eight, uh, a woman who was eight months pregnant jumping on the train. Oof. And um, <laughs> once again, I mean, I'll just give you a perfect example of just mm -hmm. the entitlement of where we come from. So it's very dangerous. I sit down and do this and she's eight months pregnant. And I'm asking her about why she would do this, why she would do this at such a point in her. Mm -hmm. God is, and everything was God. God is mm -hmm. going to protect me. God is going to say, God means for this, God, 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 God. I just asked her a very simple question. What if God isn't protecting you? What if you think that, but it's not really the case? Which is, in a way, it's a truthful, you know, my response is, come on, let's, for a second, let's pretend that God has nothing to do. Mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, it's a slightly obnoxious question maybe, isn't it? Because she looked at me and she says, well, if I don't have God, I don't have anything else. And the point being precisely, she reminded me of why the film was being made. These people are, you know, whether they're fleeing environmental reasons, remember there were a lot of storms, a lot of hurricanes that wiped out people's livelihoods, their farms, their lands, and they didn't have anything. So they're, all, they're like environmental migrants. There are other migrants coming because they want to get their mother in eye operation or their sister needs an, an opera in their medication and they're going to try and get money because because the medicine's too expensive so people were coming for all kinds of reasons not just reuniting right so for some people god is really all they have like what there's nothing else to grab onto there's no other hope except her hope that God is protecting her. And I thought that that, I mean, that was really just. Psh. So why, I have to ask, why did that not make it into the film? Because there were so many, you know. Right. <laughs> I had a cut, the, my, the editor on the film was, you can't tell every story. No one's gonna remember. You're telling to, you've got 15 kids in this movie. Like no one's gonna know, an, you, an audience cannot track all of these people. And it was true. It was, there were so many that people didn't remember and couldn't follow a story because there were so many. To, and I had to, you know, this is the painful part about telling a film is that you can't tell everyone's stories. Mm -hmm you capture it on film, but you can't necessarily include it. And that's why if you look at the Which Way Home um, site, website, we did a video clip library, all these cuts that we had that never made it in, we wanted to at least give a lot of people representation right. that didn't make it in. So there's like 33, I think, short films in there that people can oh. click on at whichwayhome.net. Sure. Um, and that, you know, so I tried, I really tried right. to, you know, try to represent all the possible stories. But hers was one of those stories. And, I, you know, and part of it was, this is a really a film about children. Mm -hmm. And we did have a mother, if you remember the baby with the rash and. Right. So we did our best to try and represent, you know, um, but, you know, that's the tough part is then you have to make a film that makes sense and is complete and it's only. 80 to 90 minutes. Right. So that actually brings up another question that I had. Did the children, did they understand why you were filming them and interviewing and talking to them? Did they, I mean, like you said, this has been used in this very big education awareness realm, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Did they really have an understanding of what, what that meant here? Um, I can't speak to what anyone truly understands in terms of, you know, how the film, you know, it's not like I sat down and said, oh, and we're going to take this to ICE and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, those outreach right. goals were only when we got the film done, were we able to really execute those outreach goals. But prior to mm -hmm. that, I wasn't sure ICE would, I wasn't even sure I was going to get a film done because the funding wasn't completely through. Remember, mm -hmm. once we came back, once I came back with some footage from the Sundance, um, and then I took it and showed it to different people, then Mr. Mudd came on board. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mudd Productions are the producers, Leanne Halfan, Russell Smith, and John Malkovich. So they saw it, mm -hmm. and they agreed to try and raise money to get the film made. So the only real, and HBO gave a small amount for development, but it was a nominal amount. But the film took so long to make because it was so hard to raise funding. Because remember, back in those days, immigration was not a sexy subject. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some films here and there, some maybe historical docs, but no one, there wasn't a lot of immigration films. Um, it just wasn't a topic that anyone was funding, really. Um, and if they were, they weren't given lots of money to just go and shoot it already. So the film stopped and started for years and years. And then finally, once full, once Mr. Mudd came on to raise money and Fulbright came on, then I was actually able to finally go back. Mm -hmm. But that was until 2006. So, you know, it's hard to lay out the entire thing when you don't know what the, the thing is. 
But right. what we did tell people, I mean, we told children, but then remember, you can't just have children in your movie. You have right. to talk to adults. You have yes. to legally connect to their families. So Olga and Freddie were traveling, but there was an aunt that was with them. So we asked permission. We didn't just start shooting them. Excuse mm -hmm. me, shoot is a wrong word to use, filming them. Mm -hmm. um, so we got permission that way. And then with when we met Kevin and Fito for the first time, we asked if they'd like to do it. We explained to them what we were doing, that we were making a documentary film, that we were gonna, that I was from New York and I was gonna show them this. But mm -hmm. we immediately wanted to talk to Kevin. Do you have a mother? Do you have a father? And in the case of Kevin, we immediately called his mother. Mm -hmm. And then we were able to contact Fito's aunt who raised him because his father had died and his mother was. Right. So we got permission from parents before we went on this. And that's really important because the ethical aspect of how you make a film, especially when children are your subjects, is really important. Like I have wondered that the, the whole time I was watching Watching it, you know, as an educator here, you know, at the university, if I want to do a research project and I work with young adults, you know, I have to submit for IRB, you know, to, to get the institutional review board to portray. So I do remember watching it and just being like, clearly they just weren't out there with cameras stumbling around, like, hey, do you want to talk about why you're riding this train? Right. So thank you, you can for do that, I yeah. think. But we weren't just doing a sit down interview movie. This mm -hmm. was the film that follow people that's right. a whole different kettle of fish right yeah yeah no I, I had wondered that the whole time I was like how is she doing this so, oh thank by you. the book and remember yeah, yeah. any this room and it's also important to understand that any film that gets on HBO or anything they have lawyers the lawyers want to see your releases you create a book of yeah. releases and they I mean these are children they can't say if Kevin said yeah film me right. I can't just well, right. I could, I guess, but <laughs> I know he has a mother and his mother is the one who should grant permission. Right. Right. So we made sure that families understood and all of, you know, went through that with them. And, you know, so by the time the film was supposedly complete, we had to turn a book over of releases to show and prove that we mm -hmm you know, did this properly. Um, and so, I, I suppose yeah. that plays into why then you also had contact with their families, you know, mm -hmm. kind of on yeah. later in the film as well too, um, and to get them to speak. So um, I want to shift a kind of um, to a question that I had, you know, that I'm still questioning, like maybe I must have missed something in the film, but obviously, you know, you talk, about how it is illegal to ride on the trains, right? That, that is anybody out there super, super stopping it? No, not really, but it's illegal to ride on top of the trains. But then there's the Grupo Speta, um, and they appeared to be part of some, you know, federal organization. I'm, I'm kind of wondering just more about Grupo Speta. So, sure. uh, you know, my, my sense is like that the Mexican government officially isn't really recognizing that people ride these trains because that's illegal and not allowed. But then there's this organization that I'm assuming is part of the federal government. But please correct me if I'm wrong, if it's regional government, nonprofit, what, you know. Yeah. So Grupos Beta is a fed. I mean, they're a, they're a part of Mexican immigration. OK. What was, what was happening is because there were so many deaths, so many people in medical distress, because remember, people are coming from all over. All of a sudden, they're in on Mexican territory and they have diabetes or they faint or they fall off and their legs are cut off or they um, have a heart attack or they are dehydrated, which is mostly a lot of. Right. Um, so they created this Grupo Speta all throughout the country and in some grupos betas, they only give out water. Other grupos betas give out crack. You know, it depends. They all have different things they do. The grupos beta we followed, um, they gave out food and crack and medical assistance. So, but they are migration, except they're not enforcers. They don't carry weapons. They only operate during certain times of day because even they can't go out in the middle of the night up against these dangerous situations and criminal networks. So, but they are 
Mexican immigration. They're a federal, it's a federal program in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a really, really interesting concept to me. Um, and, you know, the boys were so excited to see them, you know, as it was portrayed in the film and everything too, which makes a lot of sense, but I, I did, I found myself kind of catching and being like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> um, but, but that does seem to be, you know, an incredible relief program. Um, that, this was you know, Mexican, yeah, this was the Mexican yeah. government's way of trying to stave off, you know, these Bigger medical, places. you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Interesting. So there were, um, you know, we followed mostly the children in the story, but, you know, just like Grupo Speta kind of made an appearance and they were a really interesting part of, you know, this journey to me. Um, but there are also at the railroad junctions, it seems like these sort of, you know, shelters or groups mm -hmm. were those all connected as well? Are they kind of, um, can, I guess, can you just tell us more about those you know, people at the, the different um, junctions that were helping um, and assisting people with either a place to rest or food or, or what have you. It seemed well, like you're something- bringing in, Now you're bringing affiliated. in the church. You're bringing yeah. in the church. So for example, you know, I think at the time it was illegal to give food or shelter to, you know, people are in it from another country, they're in, in Mexico illegally, but, the church itself, for example, in Tapachula, there is a famous Padre Florigoni. He's a famous mm -hmm. Scalabrini priest. And the Scalabrini charism is about migrants. It's about aiding migrants. So if anyone looks mm -hmm. up Scalabrini, that is their charism. That's their, their focus, helping migrants. Mm -hmm. So um, he had this big, uh, this, well, I don't want to say big, but he had this very well-known shelter in Tapachula at the time the trains had been starting in Tapachula. Mm -hmm. When one of the uh, hurricanes came, all the lines got destroyed and the government decided to not build there. And also the more inland they built, it was tougher for migrants just to come right over the border of Guatemala and get into Tapachula. So mm -hmm. then things started in Ariaga, right? Or Tenosique. Right. So you had Ariaga, which was still in Chiapas, if I'm not mistaken, up farther from Tapachula. And then you had Tenosique, which was just right over the board, right? Mm -hmm. And then trains started from those two places. But you had, so you had the Scalabrinis, you had other priests or religious um, groups operating, creating casas, casas del migrante around the country, mm -hmm. right? And those were often religious, right. religious that did this. Um, and then there were, you know, along the way, probably other shelters by other groups, but that's, but whenever we got to these better funded or bigger Casa del Migrantes, they were always connected to the church. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I had wondered if it was a network either formally or informally. Well, I mean, you know, religious makes sense. people church, were probably right. network trying to exchange it from, you know, I'm sure these, they had a network, but it wasn't like there was right. one pot of money going to all these different, no, to support these shelters, no. Mm -hmm. Well, and then other people who's, um, I don't know that their stories were necessarily kind of um, purposefully portrayed in, in the way that these other groups were, but one, um, some people that struck me kind of earlier in the film, it seemed that uh, they were maybe selling food to people who were riding the trains or, um, and, and it, with the boys, it seemed like they were just giving the children the food as opposed to selling it to them. Um, it, did I see that correctly? Uh, do you find that those people were more willing to maybe like, you know, try, try to care for the children in ways that mon mon money wasn't being exchanged, I guess? Well, so, okay. I mean, there, yeah. there was a, a well-known group at the time, people who would throw sandwiches to the trains, right? They would uh, show up, that was along a certain stretch, but mm -hmm. these are freight trains, right? they don't stop. So the engine, whoever's running the trains obviously mm -hmm. had deals to stop in certain places. Right. And the deals they made to stop, it's almost in a way they're kind of like trap, you know, Right. Coyotes in a way too, because they know these people are on their trains and yet they're stopping in places where they don't need to stop. Sure. The freight trains. So what would build up with these little, you know, so they know the train would stop in this town. So all these people would make food and sell it. So these, these markets showed up to service mm -hmm. migrants because they knew they, the train would stop there on their way. 
Mm -hmm. And we were in, I think it was Tenosique at the time, and we were there waiting for a train to stop as a filmmakers. But what we didn't realize was the trains weren't gonna stop because we were there, because it wasn't, uh, so they weren't supposed to stop. So what happened right. was first we were welcomed. And then like days later, people were like, you better get out of here. People are getting angry at you. And we were like, angry at us for what? They said, the longer you stay here, the longer everyone else does. The minute you leave, the train's going to stop. So you, you know, another day or two, people are going to get angry and they may right. retaliate against you. And that's when we went, okay, are we get it now. Right. We better leave because people are getting desperate and they're also right. hungry. Like the longer we're right. there, the trains, you know, the engineers are just not going to stop. You're making economic impact negatively we're making, for them. And we didn't realize this. We're making an impact on everyone's lives. We're delaying everybody because no engineer wants the camera there because they're not supposed to stop there. Right. And we were like, okay, we'll go. Right. right. Don't need a riot. We'll yeah. see you later. Yeah. Well, on videos, you know. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, Honestly, maybe is all of the questions that I, you know, had and, and wanted to um, ask you if there are any more from the audience as well. Um, I know I didn't read many of them verbatim um, because I thought we covered probably some of them as we were discussing some things, but um, do please pass forward, you know, any, any questions that anybody here um, in the audience still has, but, um, you know, Rebecca, the, the, I think this last question that I at least have for you could be answered a number of ways, but what would you say, particularly creating Which Way Home, what was the biggest challenge? What was the biggest hurdle? What? Money. Was, yeah, money. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This was a really hard film to make because it was very hard raising money to get this film made. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare. I thought this film would take a couple of years. It took like, by the time I started, literally from pitching it to ending and then, and then plus the outreach and the website and all the work that goes on after a film's done. It's like 10 years of my life. And the big delay was not having funding. And that's why, you know, my, my Fulbright stipend, like a lot of it went to making the film. Lucky I don't eat a lot, so I don't. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I know from room. experience those um, and that many in the room would agree those Fulbright stipends aren't, you know, you're not living high um, really with those, but but um, that is wonderful that you were yeah, able to. I mean, I remember, I'll tell you, I, I don't want to admit it, but I'm going to admit it just because, you know, filmmaking is not, not always fun, especially if the subject you pick is not popular. Yeah. Popular. Um, we... I remember now, it was October. I wanted to show that, you know, children die. It isn't just they're on it, you know, right. Really bad things happen. And we got, we connected with Jesus Torreblanca, who was this lovely man who was at the time in the, you know, he was kind of the guy who ran the Bureau of, of uh, what was it called again? Uh, you know, Mexico has in different estados, they have the Bureau del Migrant, um, but there's a name for it, I'm forgetting, but I'll remember in a little bit. But anyway, he would be the one to fly and repatriate the bodies of mm -hmm. those who were found dead if they were in the United States. And he connected us to those two family, Eloy and Rosario's families. Right. And we had to go film. I mean, this was our time the body, we were waiting for this body to come back and waiting. The summer didn't happen. It finally did. And he says, this is the time you have to do it. And I remember at the time we had no money, nothing. I called my sister crying. I never call my sister crying. But the minute she heard me crying, she goes, what's up? I need $5,000. Because I can't pay the crew. We have to do this. And she goes, no problem. I never ask my 
family from, I mean, the last thing I'd ever do is ask them for money for a film. I mean, Jesus, like that's just a dark hole, right? Throw money into it, it's a film. But I was so desperate, we had to get this and I can't hire and work with people and then not pay people. You just, that's, right. I, I won't even go there. But that's what I mean. Like there were these moments where it was just, what am I gonna it do? Just the Everybody, startup funding, right. it was constantly throughout, yeah. Right, and boom. My sister, of course, came through. I can trust her with anything. And it was only that one time, luckily. But this is what it was like all the time making the film. It was just, you know, as soon as that money hit that account, like within hours, I went, call the cinematographer, like, we're on. Tell them we'll right. be here, right? And we just got it together. And then we went off to, because at the time, I think we were given permission to go to the Ciudad, the, Me the Mexico City airport to actually yeah. film me and the whole thing. And then mm -hmm. at the last minute, they wouldn't let us in. But we figured, ah, screw it. We'll just get with the driver, like right. let him pull out and then we'll start from there. And that's exactly what we did. Like we just, and then we were able to follow everything. Um, but that's what I mean. It's, it was just, it was tough. It was tough to do. And that was on the Fulbright, I think. Yeah, it was already there. You know, it was just, there wasn't mm -hmm. enough. There was, it was hard. So the biggest challenge was financing. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. That, that, yeah. That I mean, sense. this is, and I'm expressing something that all of us filmmakers have in documentary, right? So. Right. Right. Well, thank you again so much, Rebecca. If you have any parting words at all that you want to share, you're welcome to. Sorry. No, to are there, is there anyone I see in this, the yeah. audience there? Does anyone have any other questions that they I haven't received covered? Right, but because nope. we did, we did have a number submitted, some of, some yeah. of which that asked early on. Okay. But then, then if everyone feels satisfied, I mean, do they feel, do, do you all feel satisfied? I want to make sure that everyone <laughs> in there. Yeah. Okay. See some applause happening. Great. Oh, more applause. Oh, thank you all. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rebecca. And I, you know, this was obviously not the part um, of this was not the point of any of this, but I have to be honest that I'm I really am encouraged, in fact, to hear you say, you know, I didn't get a Fulbright back when I was graduating college. And so I never thought this would happen, but I did it again and I got it because it, it definitely can be, um, you know, discouraging for sure at times. And I'm, I'm constantly trying to encourage people to, to apply again, you know, if they don't at first succeed, but it sounds like it happened for you when it needed to happen. Yeah. I mean, listen, the, the, anyone who wants to do, pro, anyone who isn't filthy rich who doesn't have the money to do right and you need you have to get used to this it's like I always joke my middle name is Rebecca rejection Camisa <laughs> I get rejected constantly but that's the that's just the way it is and that's the way it is for everybody and you can't be deterred like when I was in was I in college yeah I was in college and I got really angry at Fulbright I was like I'm never gonna do any of and, but that was because I was hurt that I didn't get what I knew was an important story, which professional right. journalists covered, but you know, they didn't need me there, but, <laughs> but it was, the, it was great practice in mm -hmm. focusing your writing, focusing your idea, you know, going before people that are kind of no more than you do and are no more about the culture, right? And getting that rejection because the rejections, rejections can be extremely helpful because then you get feedback and you go, oh man, I didn't, yeah, I didn't do that. You know, so right. even the rejection, so I've come to realize even the rejections while annoying and horrible, <laughs> I learn a lot from them. And I just got rejected like five times three months ago and I got feedback and I understand why I got rejected. I understand completely right. why. So it's a constant learning process, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. I mean, I'm telling you, you just go for everything. Right. It's like, get rid of the emotion and treat it like a numbers game. You know, mm -hmm. all the deadlines go for it because someone that out of the blue, you didn't expect it will be there. Um, and like I said, I mean, as soon as I, the Fulbright was just, and then the people, we haven't even talked about Comexis, the people. Yeah. They were so fantastic, so supportive. You know, and I That's went wonderful. and said, guys, I hate to say this, but this film is going to lead me to some dark places. And 
I want to let you know this. They were completely supportive and they, they were there to help. And so even, so I don't know, you know, we always hear about the Fulbright, but we don't hear about the Fulbright organizations in the host countries that are helping the missions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's not like you get a guys, it's not like you get a Fulbright and then you just go off and go crazy. You know, mm -hmm. no, you go, there's a whole structure of Fulbright there in the host country and there, and it's, it, it was so fantastic. And they all, Comexis needs to be applauded. They were great. Um, <laughs> I had actually wondered, you know, too, with, like you said, you told them, I'm going to go to some dark places. I was kind of curious, like, did they have any, I don't know, did you kind of get any sense that also like the story that you were going to tell was maybe going to like not paint, you know, Mexico in the greatest light. And so this cultural exchange was, you know, were, were they, I don't know, maybe less helpful is what comes to no. mind, but were they, yeah. That's what I was expecting. I was expecting, okay, it's sensitive. Right. These are government relationships. It's right. diplomatic. It, there's, a, I mean, the, with migration, there's enough blame to go around. It's yeah. not like Mexico's the bad guy. Um, <laughs> the chain of, of, non-dysfunctional the, the the dysfunctional chain mm -hmm. is you know is all throughout the hemisphere in all the countries right all of them have you know responsibility um and i thought oh i should be careful but but i think this was the bot i think this is really important number one are you behaving ethically that's number one mm -hmm. also this was our mantra while filming Safety first, right? The children for safety first, film mm -hmm. second. For example, I had a lot of really great opportunities to get some really criminal stuff and to really, as a filmmaker, ah, oh, this is the shot. We're gonna right. get this. All we have to do is go. Like we know it's gonna happen. And then, but the question is, yeah, but mm -hmm. how is our presence with a camera? Is that gonna endanger? The children is that going to mm -hmm. endanger the situation and if the kids since we're following the children we're with them it's not like we're with them working to keep, but we are no so, so right. are we going to invite danger to them because of like and i just had to, and we kept and as a crew we kept talking about it and then finally we had to make decision no we're going to miss one of the most amazing moments but right. I can't say we're we're not going to create a problem. Not that we're violent, but could uh, we right. impact it to make violent people act more Your violent? Your presence, yeah. And, well, and it's, you, it is alluded so to the coyotes right. are talked about, right? The the cartels, the different criminal organizations are all referred to, but that was something I noticed that. It wasn't and I didn't know if that was because it wasn't as if that was the story you were you know aiming to tell um but you know they it wasn't as if you had interviewed someone with like a blurry face or anything like that right and so also, remember the criminal networks of the south and the northern border well, yeah. are different not that not that yes. they're not well connected somehow but there was and at the time it was there was a difference we were dealing right. with basically smugglers coyotes maybe right. drugs but that's not our film mm -hmm. but once you get to the northern border it's all narco territory right so it's a whole different you know way of filming or you know it was tough getting to the, it was roughy mm -hmm. but um that was different but i think the important thing is i think comexis this was the point of my meeting with them was that mm -hmm. as long i think it was important for him to understand that when i went out there i wasn't going to act like a crazy unleashed filmmaker Mm -hmm. leaving a trail of whatever because I got to get my shot right that's irresponsible that they had to know that if we were in these situations that we were going to do the right thing right I think that was the most important and guess what is the film would the film have been stronger if I got the shot of the crooked cops come would mm -hmm. it have made a difference really in the end mm -hmm. I think the film is strong enough it but could have ended up being that excess line. footage you couldn't have fit in anyway to tell the story you were aiming to. Yeah. The bottom line is the children's lives came first, their safety came first, and filming came second. And that's how we went. 
Yeah. But Comexis was part of, you know, part of understanding that, because at the end of the day, I'm a representative of the United States. What mm -hmm. I do in their country reflects on me, but reflects on the Fulbright program. Who's Fulbright mm -hmm. allowing to come to this country and do, you, right? It, you have mm -hmm. a responsibility on your project to <laughs> respect- Carry it out ethically and yeah, respect- Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what was concerning. And as, sir, as soon as that assurance was given and that understanding was given, it was fine. Right. Um, yeah. That's great. So that's so, wonderful I mean, that, you, that you and Comex has had such a great relationship. That is fantastic. Yeah, but I think it's important for any potential Fulbrighter. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're getting all the stuff to go and woo! Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole relationship beyond yours that you are involved in. And so, yeah, we wanted to do everything right. And at the end of the day, we would have never gotten our film on national television if, if they didn't know that we were behaving properly. And more importantly, at the end of the day, anyone who watches my film, I want them to know that what was done, no one was put at heart, you know, Mm -hmm. we behaved in the correct way and we didn't exploit right. people right you know because that's but that's just part of the ethics of filmmaking you know not to exploit mm -hmm. people to make your film better well and as you were saying too even having the self-awareness when you were in that one place for a few days the trains weren't going to stop right um so to eventually yeah develop that self-awareness of that impact and kind of have that ongoing that that seems really critically important as well yeah because people were stuck like they're not going backward right. so now they're stuck and then when we re were told we're keeping them making everything mm -hmm. stuck i was like oh man let's get the hell out of here right. like i don't want people going into danger but i certainly i don't want to cause more harm to people right absolutely right well, thank you again so much, Rebecca. No questions have come in in that time that we've been chatting. So I think we'll go ahead and stop it here. And in fact, I'll stop the recording now. Um, <laughs>